How's it? Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our live webinar. And we are not in our lounge tonight. So we are broadcasting live from 300, uh, 300 Square Studio here in Durban. First things first, can you guys just let us know about the sound and the image quality as well, if everything is all good on your side? And just drop your, your questions or suggestions in the question box that's right next to the screen. We just want to test run and see first if everything is all good on your side. We'd also just like to thank um, Sony Alpha Middle East for collaborating with us on this uh, live webinar as well as DT Phone Services. Um, if you need any information regarding DT Phone Services, please uh, send us a DM or send us a message and we will tell you about, uh, give, them the, give you the contact details, um, their website, etc. So, and you guys must be wondering who's hiding behind us. Well, this is Afros, our gorgeous model for tonight. And she is from Boss Models, a fantastic and beautiful model that's here posing for us. And we are going to be talking about a very interesting topic, which is lighting, basically a one light setup for a photo shoot. It is one of the most asked questions that we still get today. Um, we've had one previous webinar on it and um, because of the amount of questions we still got on it we thought we'd do another one so um, what we Fatima and I are wedding photographers and when we looked at our lighting setup we were looking at something that was portable um, something that was scalable um, and if you shoot weddings you should know that you don't always have enough time to set up multiple lights so what we ended up doing was we ended up looking at a one light setup where we would be able to move the light around um, and use it in a very short space of time to get the images that we want. And it can get a little bit overwhelming. I'm sure when we all started off, we started learning off YouTube videos and watching all of the studio photographers coming in with all of those lights. And my piece of advice is start simple. Learn the the most important part about lighting and that is learn about your key light because that's the main light that's going to illuminate your subject and when you get that right and and master it then you can start introducing other kinds of lighting but it's it it does yes lighting is about lighting up your subject but it also helps with translating the type of subject or, or character onto the image so it just depends so remember something, when it comes to lighting, there's no hard or fast rule. You need to come up with a lighting technique or a style that will suit you and exactly how you work. So as Siran said, as wedding photographers, we're looking at something that's light and convenient and also compact at the same time because when, as wedding photographers, we are uh, running for time and also the lack of space when it comes to photographing our subjects. And there's only certain times in the day where we are able to have the bridal couple or the bride alone to ourselves. So before we actually go into lighting techniques, there's a couple of things, a couple of basics that I think we should just cover. And um, I know it's been spoken about a lot, but it's always good to, if you do know this, to get a refresher. If you don't know this, then it's something new that you're learning. When it comes to light, your, your big issues or the big uh, decision point should be your the quality of the light, the direction of the light, and uh, the kind of light, and even the color of your light. Now, basically, for what we do, we're looking at two types of light, hard light and soft light. Um, we very seldom use hard light in wedding uh, photography because it gives a very defining uh, shadow. Um, it, it, it shows up a lot of, of, of creases and details, and a lot of times the hard light is what fashion photographers would go for. Um, if you've noticed a lot in fashion magazines, the light is, it's got a very hard edge. The shadows are very defined. Uh, the best example of that would be if you were to stand outside on a sunny day, clear sunny day, um, the sun would be your main light source. If you look at your shadow, from between 11 to about 2 o'clock, you'd see your shadow's got a very defined line. It's a very hard line. Now, if you do the same on a cloudy day, you would notice that your shadow would be a lot softer because the cloud cover would act as a diffuser. So the same principle is used when using off-camera flash or strobes or whatever. If you use bare bulb, 
with no diffusion between the light source and your subject, the light is going to be very hard. If you diffuse that light, it's going to be softer. That's one of, one of the rules. The other big rule is, and I know everyone speaks about this, it's that the larger your light source, the softer your light, which is true. But one thing that people don't seem to mention, though, is the distance from your light source to your subject, no matter how big it is, can change that soft light into a hard light as well. And again, I use the sun as, as an example. If you were to put the earth and the sun next to each other, the sun is millions times bigger than the earth. But because of the distance from the sun to the earth, the sun becomes a very small hard light relative to where I am standing on earth. So in that way, that same principle translates through to your light modifiers. You can have a massive softbox, but if your softbox is too far from your subject and you're still getting light on your subject, that soft light will become a hard light. So these are all principles that you need to be uh, cognizant of, and these are the, 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 the factors that you need to take into consideration when deciding on what type of light to use. Can we get into demo and showcase hard and soft light? Um, and how distance plays a part when it comes to having uh, your light and your subject. So it's relative to the distance as well, the quality and, and the qu uh, quantity of light. And um, why sometimes hard light does work, especially if you're looking at high fashion shots, and softer light works also for certain shots. So we're just going to experiment and demo on our gorgeous model up rows. And yeah, we will Let's showcase it now. For this first demo, I'm using a uh, Prophoto B1, and I'm just using the modeling light for this. So I'm just turning the, the strength of the light down slightly so that I can just demonstrate if I hold the light. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. If you can zoom in, Jonathan. Just look at that camera with Jonathan standing. You'll see there's a very hard defining line under the chin. Let's move. I hope this is not too bright for you. And even though I'm this close, it's still a bare light. So there's no diffusion, basically. This B10 does have some kind of diffusion, but it's still, it's still a very hard light. If you look at the shadows under the chin, the shadows of the eyelashes and so forth. Right. If I move it slightly back, you'll notice those shadows don't actually get softer. So what we'd normally do is we would shoot through a scrim just to soften the light. And a scrim is basically similar to what we have over here. I don't know if you can get this uh, modify in, Jonathan. This layer of diffusion diffuses the light, softens the light. If, if we've got a, do we, do we have a diffuser? Uh, reflector diffuser that we can show people yeah. or even just if I put this light into a softbox and then zoom in you can see immediately you can see the difference mm. you see the shadows are, are less defined and are quite soft now, this kind of lighting is ideal for our type of work. Uh, it's a very flattering light. It's very soft light, very diffused light. So um, a lot of times, in fact, most of the times, this is what we do when we are shooting bridal portraits. So I'll just show you once again. That's the diffused light with, with the diffuser. And no diffusion. You can see there's a massive difference and both lights can be used. You need to decide what type of light you want to use on your subject. This kind of light, for example, this hard light, is not ideal for older people because of wrinkles. It shows up, as you can see, it shows up a lot of creases. Um, even if you look at, at some of the, the, the clothing as well, some lines on the clothes and, and, and so forth, it does show up very hard shadows. 
Uh, the other thing when it comes to when it comes to hard life is, as Hirat says, if your subject, if you want to showcase the detail on your subject, so when it, sometimes it just depends on what you're trying to achieve out of the shot, and you're looking at texture, and you're looking at, um, for example, architecture as well, when you want to showcase the edges and it's in, um, pay a lot of emphasis on, on the shape of your subject, then yes, hard light will work. And then, as Siraj mentioned, softer light works best for bridal because we want to portray that whole um, soft look, elegance, and um, uh, elegant feel to the image. Yep. And then, at the same time, we're working around makeup looks. So the makeup, for now, for example, she has a high glam look. Sometimes you will you'll just have to play. Sometimes the hard light will work. Uh, depending how you direct it onto her face to showcase the makeup look. And then the softer look will work if you want to showcase a lot more of the highlighted cheeks and the nose areas. When we started using uh, off-camera flash, um, one of the first modifiers we used was a beauty dish. Now, um, for if you're not familiar with a beauty dish, a beauty dish is a very hard, punchy light. Um, and what it does is it does show up lots of, uh, it sculpts the face, it, it, it gives uh, good contrast to the face, and normally it wouldn't be used for wedding portraits, but what we did was, you can get the beauty dish and put a layer of diffusion on the dish itself. Um, we loved that kind of light, because it wasn't as hard as a beauty dish, but it wasn't as soft as a softbox. So it fell somewhere in between the harshness of the beauty dish and the softness of the of the softbox, and what that, that did for us is it sculpted the face of the bride. So you'd get a very you'd get a soft shadow, but good definition on the face. So these are all things that you need to uh, need to look into when 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 deciding on which modifiers to use. And again, it's going to be a case of you're just playing around and um, it took us some time to understand and I was also settle on a look and a type of lighting technique that's going to work for our style of photography. And if you view our, um, our social media platforms, you will find that it's very high fashion inspired kind of shots where it's a, a spotlight on, on the subject. And talking about spotlights, that's the other thing about light shaping tools and these auto boxes come with the tools to help you shape the light. So you, if we can remove the, um, or if, yeah, if you can remove the, we just want to show you exactly how the octobox will work. Are we good with this angle? Okay. Okay, you can explain to them. Okay, this can come out as well. Yeah, so basically, just let me do this yeah. over there and just drop this even more. Yeah. That would be inside of the softbox. Um, you'd see your bare bulb, and again, this softbox or softboxes can be used without diffusion depending on the quality of the light that you want. These softboxes normally come with two layers of diffusion. You'd get your inner baffle, which you'd see over here, and then the outer baffle. The inner baffle is used uh, to try and cut down on that hard highlight sometimes that you get if the center of the light lines up with the center of the, of, of the face of your, of your subject. So that's what that inner baffle is for. It's just to bring down that highlight a bit. What we like doing, when using softboxes is feathering the light. And what that does is, instead of having the light, uh, the center of the light on the, the face of the subject, we have our subject on the edge of the softbox. So uh, let me just push this up and explain over here. The center of that softbox, of the light, lines up with the center of our model. That would be how a lot of people do shoot, and there's nothing wrong with shooting uh, like that. Um, what we love doing is lifting it up and having the edge of the softbox line up with 
uh, the face of our model. In that way, you're not getting the full power of the, of the, of the light falling on, uh, on your model, but you're getting that little bit of light spill. And we find that using our softbox in this way gives us a little bit of a harder light. The problem with this, though, is if you feather too much, your soft light becomes a hard light. So you need to find out where your, 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 your sweet spot is. Unfortunately, we're having some issues tethering our, um, our camera to our uh, laptop. Uh, we were hoping to take images while we're doing the demo. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, for some other reason, it's not working tonight. So we'll just talk you guys through it. So like I said, we love using just the edge. And a lot of times, if we do not have enough time to add a grid to our softbox to control the spill of the light, we would then also use feathering, where we'd have the edge of the softbox line up with the, with the face of our subject, whether it be a model or bride. And in that way, the light would be facing away from the backdrop, of the background, and your background goes darker. A lot of times, at our functions, um, the backdrops or backgrounds on the stages of these weddings we shot are very elaborate and very reflective. So we need to, uh, we needed to be a bit creative in terms of not getting too much light spilling onto the back. And there are times where, where we are given less than five minutes to do bridal portraits. And in those five minutes, there's no time to add a grid to um, make the light more directional. So what we do is we tend to just feather the light. Let me just turn this so that the edge of that light is in line with the, the, the face of our bride or the model, and that the rest of the light just pulls forward and does not spill too much on the back. And again, you must be wondering, how do we fit the octobox into our venue as well? Uh, when it comes to wedding, wedding photography, and especially trying to incorporate a creative shoot on the stage, we already know in advance the amount of space we're going to be working with. There are times as well when we are caught up with the lack of time and space, and we just don't have the time to incorporate the octobox, we'll end up just using a, a wide umbrella, a wide white umbrella, to help spread the light um, onto our subjects. And again, it's a case of just practicing and trying to maneuver our light so that we can get the desired look we want from that shot. Right. Um, do we have a honeycomb grid? Uh, I I don't no. think so. Okay, so the other way of directing light onto your subject is using a honeycomb grid. And this honeycomb grid um, gives it a nice, dramatic, kind of like a spotlight look that you want to achieve on your subject. Yeah, you want to achieve on your subject. And uh, that adds for a lot of drama, drama into... Um, into the shot and into the, the image that you're trying to create, right? So the other, the other aspects when it comes to a light um, and working with light in wedding photography is that you will know in advance the amount of space and the time that you have. And sometimes you might not be equipped with a softbox or you might just have an LED light. And even with just an LED light, like how we experimented earlier, let me just get it for you. So an LED constant light. Oops. Can you do that? Yeah, okay, you can do that. <laughs> With an LED constant light, you can go ahead and soften this light by using a scrim. And using a scrim, just like Siraj experimented earlier, is that it helps to soften it. And you can create a lot of images, a lot of looks out of um, just using this simple setup. So it's not as complicated as setting up the light and putting it on a stand and just having it ready for the shot. Um, are we going to... Let's go into yeah. the loop. Okay. So now the different types of lighting that Siraj is going to work with um, on Afros. Yeah, so what you need to do is you need to decide beforehand what type of lighting you want to use on your subject. Um, for us wedding photographers, it would always be the most flattering uh, type of light. Um, but there are different lighting techniques um, that can be used. Um, there's three basic ones that, 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 um, that kind of cover everything, and then there's variations of each of those. So you'd normally get flat lighting, broad lighting, 
and you'd get uh, beauty lighting. Um, the flat lighting is normally where you light up the side of the, the, the face of your model that's closest to the camera. So the left hand side of Afros is closer to the camera. Excuse me. So we light up the broad side. I don't know if you can zoom in, uh, Jonathan. And if you can see the shadow on the far side of the of Afros' face. This is broad lighting. This is not the most flattering way to light your subject because broad lighting normally adds a bit of bulk. So a lot of times if your subject has got a very narrow face, then broad lighting would add a little bit of, of not, not bulk as, as such, but it just adds that bit more to the face itself. Short lighting is where, let's just have a look at where you are. Just turn slightly away from the camera. There we go. Is that too much, too much? Yeah, there we go. Short lighting is where you light the side of the face that's moved away from the camera. So I don't know if you can see the difference there. And this, this kind of lighting is a bit more flattering. Now, a lot of times, this is the kind of lighting that gets used for portraits. As you can see, it does slim the face down a bit. And uh, especially for women, this is what they want. So if someone tells you, as a photographer, take some, some pounds off my face. This is the kind of lighting that you should be looking at. OK, we just, we're just going to improvise a little bit since our, the tethering is not working. As Siraj demonstrates the uh, type of lighting, I'm going to take a shot with our Sony A7R4 in 85mm lens. And then we're going to try to showcase it onto, straight onto the cameras. OK, so we'll start with broad lighting again. Just turn your face slightly away. We are showcasing. Just check, check the. Yeah, perfect. All right. Then we'll do short lighting. Just come over to the slightly, just so it's like it's the speaker spot over there. That's short lighting. Uh, of course, can you just take your chin and face it towards the scrum for me? Perfect. A little bit more away from me. There we go. You tell me where you want the light. Perfect. Right, and then flat lighting is is is, is the third uh, technique that we that we love using. Um, it's called flat lighting because the face is lit up evenly. Uh, in some cases, it's, it's not as flattering as, as the short lighting because the minute you remove any shadows, you're actually removing depth from, from a face. If you can look straight at the camera, that's flat lighting or, be or beauty lighting. Can you see, can you zoom in over there? Yeah, perfect. Right, do you want to take a shot? Or? Okay. What we like doing in our weddings is we like having the, the, our light source at 45 degrees above our subject. Uh, this light is a bit harsh. Uh, let me just add it to this modifier. And if I bring it in, Ten. You'll see it's a very flattering light in that sense. And then even the shadows, the shadows under the under the nose forms a little butterfly. This kind of lighting, funnily enough, um, the movie stars, the female movie stars from the 40s, 50s, and I think even in the 60s, they had written into their contracts that whenever they are photographed at the studio, it's the beauty lighting that they need to be photographed in. And that lighting, again, I'll show you, it forms a little butterfly under the nose as well. So some people tend to call it butterfly lighting as well. Just drop your chin slightly, drop your chin, drop your chin, there we go. I don't know if it's, if you guys can see it from here. There's a little bit of a, of a butterfly under Afros' nose. The shadow under the chin as well is not defined, it's not a hard shadow. 
this is the lighting we use for our makeup shots. Right. So those are the three main types of lighting. I'm not sure if you can call it types of lighting, but there's variations on those on the, the, the those lights as well, or those those kinds of lights as well, lighting as well. So before we go on, we just like to bring to your guys' attention about the um, Sony special. Uh, that if you purchase any Sony gear. I think there's a few that are not on the list with regards to lenses, and there's a 10% cashback available. Um, can we have that on the screen there, Kai? So the T's and C's are on, uh, on the voucher, and you use the voucher code TTL, I think at DT, at DT uh, when you go to purchase your Sony gear. So basically how it works is you purchase the gear from whatever retailer or from, from DT, I should say, and you pay the full price, and you go on to www.cashbacks.ca.za and then claim back 10% from the purchase uh, that you've made, and they will give you back 10% of what you paid for the, for the equipment. Before we move on, are there any questions uh, coming through? We'd like to take some time with questions as well. This is the only way you end up learning, is that you ask the questions and we'll be able to help you guys. Any questions, guys? No questions? Okay, perfect. Right, so we'll carry on. Um, the, 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 the other techniques that we want to showcase, uh, there's, there's a few. We don't want to take up, uh, go, get too technical, I should say, but excuse the hardness of the light. I'm pushing it all the way up to maximum strength so that you guys can actually see the shadows. One thing that, that, that we've noticed that some photographers are doing is they're blasting their subject with light um, and in that way removing all shadow. The problem with removing shadow is you remove definition. You're flattening the image. And um, if that's what you want from the image, then it's fine. But for us, when we are shooting, we always try and create depth in an image. And if you want to create depth in your image, shadows is how you do it. Or shadows is one of the ways of doing it, I should say, not how you do it. Um, like I mentioned earlier, shadows give images definition, especially on the face. So consider how much of light you're actually using to light up your subject. Don't try and get rid of all the shadows. It really, really just flattens the image. So the first... Uh, technique that I want to show, or, or kind of, of setup that I want to show, is similar to, just turn, before we go, just turn slightly, there we go, look straight at that camera, yeah, is loop lighting. If you look at, if you look at Afros, you see the shadow of the nose on the side. Right here, guys. But it, this, that shadow doesn't close off or cut off any of the light you'll see that there is a shadow, but the light itself is on the rest of the face. That is called loop lighting. It's that little loop that's over there. That's called loop lighting. If you move the light slightly further, you'll see that shadow start cutting off, and it forms a little triangle. That is Rembrandt lighting. So, so the basically triangle, the shadow is created from her cheekbone and the shadow of her nose, and she'll get this, you'll get this triangle under her eye and the eye that's actually away from the light. So that's called Rembrandt lighting. You guys can Google about the artist Rembrandt, how he used that technique in his, in his uh, artistic pieces. Yeah, in his, in his painting. One, one thing again that we, that we like to mention is, if you want to learn about light, it might not seem the most obvious thing to do, but if you want to learn about light, go and study the grand masters, the painters, uh, grand masters. They had to paint in light and um, we found that the way they've done it, a lot of photographers can learn from what they've done. So if you look at Rembrandt's uh, paintings, for example, you will always see the triangle on the subject's face. And that's exactly why this is called Rembrandt lighting. So a bit of history when it comes to Rembrandt. He was an artist that had this a specific room that he used to work in. And in that room, he had a large window source that was quite up high. Now for him, his light source was fixed. 
So he used to take his subjects and place them in line with that light and, and be able to create that triangle under the eye. And for him, that, that's his style that he created. Now, he was restricted in that circumstance that he had just one key light. Here, as a photographer, you have a key light that you can actually move around. It's in your control. So it's up to you as to what kind of style you want to create for your images. And exactly what we are showing here, that you can move from a, from a narrow light, moving from narrow light, then you move on to uh, flat lighting, and then move on to the next side of your subject and create another incident type of light. Even moving it just above, Siraj, if you can just hold it above, just above the model's face, and then you're creating the butterfly. So I want you to just look straight ahead in that camera. If you can see under her nose, let's have the light a little bit more shaping under her nose, more this way for me. There's that butterfly look under her nose. That's called the butterfly uh, style of lighting. This is exactly what you want to get in your image. And then... Now, just, just to reiterate, that kind of lighting is what we use for um, a lot of our brides and especially for the makeup shots because it's very flattering. It does sculpt the face slightly, it gives the face a bit more contour and so forth. Right? So one thing I just want to show you guys, if you start out your light on this side, let me just see. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bit difficult now because there's, there's another light bouncing in. But if you do split lighting, which is lighting up just one half of the face, your light would be perpendicular to your model. And then as you move the light around, you can see it becomes Rembrandt lighting. Okay, let's move cut, it a bit again. Let's cut this main light of ours that we have up right now for just a little bit. Let's have a look. Just tell me if the shadow is, 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 is... No, it's good. Okay. That's split lighting. So that's lighting up one half of the face. This is a very dramatic, as you can see, a very dramatic way, or it gives you very uh, dramatic images. And if this is what uh, the kind of image you're going for, that's how you would light up your subject. But it's interesting to note that you can start out on one end of your subject, and as you move around, you'll see you get from, from there, you'll get Rembrandt lighting. You move it slightly more, you get uh, loop lighting. Move it slightly more, you'd get beauty lighting, and again, if the model's face is turned slightly away from the camera and you do the same, just turn it slightly towards me, you do the same, you go from short lighting, flat lighting, broad lighting. So two things, either you move your light or you move your model. Any questions on Okay, Instagram? so we have some questions. Uh, Jonathan, can we just get that light up? We have some questions. Uh, any advice on various Sony lenses, lenses looming for, uh, looking for portrait and landscape? Um, portrait lenses would normally be your longer lenses, so you would be looking at your, either your 70 to 200 if you're looking for a telephoto zoom, um, or you can use the uh, Sony 85 more. Some people use the 50 mm or the 55 mm lens, uh, but just a, a word of caution there, if you are too close to your subject using 50 mm, you will still get a little bit of distortion. So it's something that you, you can fix in post, but if you were to use a, an 85 mm, for example, um, you would not get that kind of distortion. Your sweet spot for portraits is 85 to 135. Anything uh, wider than, than 85, you get a little bit of distortion, depending on how close you are to your subject. Anything above 135, you start pulling in compression. Um, I don't want to get too technical, but basically compression is just pulling in your background closer to your subject. So those are things you need to look at. If you want that kind of compression, then you would go for a lens that's longer than 135. But normally portrait lenses, your sweet spot is between 85 and 135. Your landscape uh, lenses, um, I think it just depends on, 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 on how wide you want to go. Sony's got a lens, I think the widest Sony has is 20, uh, sorry, it's 12 to 24, 
there is a, there's currently an F4, um, but there is a G Master that was announced. I'm not sure if it's released yet. I think it will be released this year. That's the 12 to 24 F2.8. So that 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 will be released this year. Yeah. Um, and then I've shot landscapes on my 16 to 35. I love my 16 to 35 because of the the focal range and so forth. And I've done landscapes on 16 as well. Um, the thing with lenses is you have to remember that a lot of times you get what you pay for. There are cheap lenses, cheaper lenses that give good bang for buck, but um, there's a reason some of these lenses um, are a lot, or not a lot, are a bit more expensive than your normal entry level lenses. And that's because of the uh, image quality and color rendition you get off these lenses. So um, you can go from a 12 to 24, 16 to 35. Some people even use the 70 to 200 to shoot landscapes. Uh, again, depending on how far they are from the kind of landscape that they want to shoot. I know of guys who use the 70 to 200 to shoot mountains in Europe, where um, they will go, someone will, they'll go and shoot Mont Blanc, for example, and um, they'll use a 70 to 200 because they can't get that close to uh, the mountain itself. I think there's another question coming through. Let's just see. Okay, our next question is from Tobelani. Hi, Tobelani. I hope you're well. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for your question. Your work is really amazing. Thank you so much. I'd like to know where do you find your inspiration? What inspires you? What gear do you shoot with? Um, and how did you break into fashion photography? So one question at a time. So what inspires us is exactly everything about fashion and how we work with fashion, uh, how, we, how we want to portray our bride like she's, she came out of a fashion magazine. So inspiration comes from looking at magazines and looking at perfume ads especially. Um, and this is the other thing as well is that our clientele, the segment of the market that we're in right now, um, haven't really been exposed to this kind of photography where we are posing them like real fashion models. And because exactly how Afros is right here, sometimes this is just the guests that are wearing these outfits and coming to the weddings. And in the fact, bride... this, this dress I'm pretty sure was at one of the weddings that we shot. Yeah, it was um, one of the guests' uh, outfits. Um, do you shoot with natural? I'm assuming you say natural available light, light, available light. We do if the circumstance asks for it and if we need to improvise on the spot. On, on the spot. Uh, we tend to also like to work with natural light so, it, so it, it works similar to how we will operate a strobe. So you find like sometimes closer to the golden hour time, um, we are able to create those spotlights with spots of light that, that are coming um, uh, or falling onto our subject. Yeah, just on that available light, um, we always, there, there's nothing wrong with, with just being an available light photographer. Um, but in our field, we found that we need to be flexible in terms of our lighting. Because a lot of times, we would shoot an 8-hour or 10-hour wedding. So you'd start in the morning, and you'd do bridal prep in a well-lit room, which doesn't even need um, any artificial light. So we would then use a large window with uh, a little bit of diffusion, netting and so forth, and with no strobes at all. And then the... We we'll actually will incorporate a uh, flash into it. A little just, bit of flash just, just, to to bounce, just to bounce onto the ceiling so we can fill it from the opposite once, angle. Yeah, once we get into the venues, our venues are very poor, poorly lit in terms of available light and natural light. So the venues that we normally shoot at normally have fluorescent light, the, the colors are not constant and so forth. So that's where we need to use our strobes um, just to fill in. And even though we're shooting in, in raw, um, uh, we find that it's in editing, it's just easier once we fill in a little bit of that light to even out things as well. And the next question from Tobilani. It was a nice paragraph, Tobilani. Thank you so much. Um, what preparation do you do before the shoot? This is a long one. <laughs> this is pretty long. Okay, so uh, most of the time when we are when we do prayer, we are aware of the location. But in a circumstance where we have no idea um, about the location um, and we've never shot here before, 
we will go there in advance and just check our angles and uh, exactly how we're going to prep our lighting. So for example, this last weekend we shot at the Grand Exotic, which is a coffee shop up in Bolito and we have never shot there before. Um, and we arrived at the location an hour before the shoot, so we could walk around and scout the spots. That's the one thing. It, it also helps with the nerves if you get there early in advance and prep for your shots and exactly what angle you want to work with and stuff. Um, and the next question she wanted to know was about, how, about wedding photography, how we get, got into wedding photography in specific. I, um, I started doing photography God, I can't even hear which year, remember which year it is, um, but I started out on a 35 film camera, so that's way back when, and um, I bought a Minolta Dynex 5, uh, didn't know photography, or didn't know what to do at all, I had the camera in auto and I went around snapping as many pics as I could, um, as you, well, at that time you used to get 36 exposures on a roll of film, so I, I used to buy 5 rolls of film, and then just go out and shoot. And um, from there, I I think it was about three years later, I bought a Minolta Maxim 7, which was still a film camera, and I carried on shooting. Um, it's only, I think, once I bought a digital camera that I, I really, I, I can say I really got into photography. Um, back in the day when I started, there was no YouTube that you could go and, and look up uh, a tutorial on, on, on photography. So I was fortunate enough that I was working with uh, someone who was a pro photographer. Um, he, did, he, he was doing pro photography for a couple of years and then he started uh, doing some IT work for the company that I was with. And he used to sit and give me tips and, and, and one of the best ways that I learned was I would go and take some images, uh, have the film develop, print the images and bring it to him and he would then start crit critiquing my image. For me, that was one of the, the best ways to learn. It was a case of him telling me, okay, you did that wrong and that wrong and that wrong. Um, one of the best pieces of advice that we can give you is don't come into it with an ego that you know everything. If, if, if someone justifiably tells you you're doing something wrong, listen to them and have a look at what they're talking about. We've done this, we've implemented this in our business as well, and it's helped tremendously with our business. Um, thank you for that. <laughs> Next question by Tobolani is, do you regularly work with the same team of makeup artists, hair and hairstylists and outfits as well? Uh, our segment of the, the wedding industry that we are, we are part of, um, yes, there's a common few and we sort of tend to work a lot with the uh, similar makeup artists, hairstylists and the wedding uh, designers. Uh, but it somehow rotates because at the end, end of the day we leave it up to the bride to decide who she's going to book for her makeup okay. and hair. And we've created a fantastic relationship actually um, and always willing to network and, and help with one another. Yeah, one, one, of, one of the things if you, if you are getting into wedding photography is build up a good network. Um, you know, nowadays, I'm not saying that a, network, a good network is mandatory, but it helps your business tremendously if you build up that network. And, and just remember that um, in terms of competition, other photographers um, don't look at other photographers in your industry as being negative competition. We look at our market and the photographers in our market and, and all of us photographers are actually very good friends. And what we do is we feed off each other's creativity. And if there's a shot that someone else has done that's brilliant, we will go and tell them that that's such a good shot. Don't, don't feel shy to praise people in your same segment. I think the other thing you also need to remember is that when you are partaking in, it, in whatever shoot it is, whether it's fashion or wedding, you need to understand that your image is carrying five other creators, well, at least five other creatives in your image. So for example, if you look at Afros, Afros firstly is a professional model from Boss Models, so that's the number one tag. Number two tag, Afro is herself because she's also a makeup artist. Number three tag is the hairstylist uh, who is uh, Rocky van der Merwe from Rock Your Hair Durban. He just as well is a well-known hairstylist in the industry. 
Number four is the dress from Catherine Montague. She's a well-known designer in the industry. Number five is she's wearing jewelry that, that's from a common brand or a shop as well. You can tag them. So the essence is in the detail of the image and how you go about taking it because you, at the end of the day, uh, I carry in all of these creators and if the image showcases their talent and the detail, they will surely also use your image in their, on their platforms and uh, also in their marketing campaigns. Perfect. Any other um, questions? Yeah, I'm just going to double check the questions. Yeah, so just to, to carry on with, that, with, the, with, the, with the network, um, it does help. Um, as much as some people would say that it's not necessary, networking does help. And uh, we found, especially in, 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 uh, in our market, or our segment of the market, I should say, that it's word of mouth that gets you business. It's a little bit of advertising, but a lot of times it's networking. When brides uh, approach us and ask us about our services, they would normally also ask us about which videographers we work with, which makeup artists we work with. They'll go down to um, makeup artists, hairstylists, everything um, that they, they don't know of. And the thing to remember, if you're into wedding photography, uh, a lot of times, if you meet the couple or the, the, the bride-to-be, she's never done this before, so everything is overwhelming. And if you have a good enough network that, that you know that you can count on, you can give good referrals. And those referrals, again, like I said, will get you more business, not only from uh, the network you're getting, but also from family and friends of the bride, because they walk away with a good experience. Another question by Mawanda. Thank you so much for this webinar and for always being such an inspiration in the scene. You are most welcome. Um, the question that she has is, what lights would you suggest if you have the budget and a bang for buck? If you have a tight budget or a big budget. <laughs> what is your <laughs> definition of a budget? Yeah, we've, uh, that, that's a very relative term there. Um, look, we currently, we are using two Godot's 8200s uh, purely because of, of the limited budget that we have and because of the scalability of uh, those uh, strobes. Uh, what I looked at was each Godox 8200 is a 200 watt uh, light on its own. You do get an adapter where you can attach two uh, Godox 200s to, to make one 400 watt light. So that was one of the big selling points for me, or one of the big uh, deal changes for me. If we needed a 200 watt light, we had one. If we needed a 400 watt light, we had the two we could combine. Um, we bought that about three years ago, I think. So the pricing that I'm going to give you now is going to be way off. So you need to go and look. What, what I normally do when I do my research into uh, buying new equipment is I will go online and check reviews of the products that you're interested in. And I won't only go and look at the good reviews. Um, I will go and look at the bad reviews as well. And trust me, every product has got a bad review. Go and look at the bad reviews and then you weigh up the pros and the cons because a lot of times you'd get people who firstly on, on YouTube, for example, are paid to do good reviews and you get people that are more balanced. So I will go look at both sides of the, of, of the story and then decide. Um, like I said, we're using the Godox system currently because of our needs and because of our budget. You can go from Godox to Profoto. The Profoto is a bit more pricey than Godox. Um, Profoto, there's nothing wrong with Profoto. It's a very good lighting system. It just depends on what your budget is. That's why I said um, budget is a very relative term. You need to look at what end of the budget or what, yeah, where your budget fits in. Another question by Mawanda is when you are taking beauty shots, what camera settings are suggested? So if you just want to grab the, and we can emphasize on the A7R, R4. You can shoot, you Okay, when it comes to portrait shots, we really enjoy the, either the 70 to 200 or the 85 mil. And that is purely because of the compression it creates and there's a, there's no distortion whatsoever. Um, and I, we love the fact that at these apertures, you can isolate your 
subject and create such beautiful depth, especially with the 85 mm prime? Yeah, the, the, the one thing that, that, that we love about the Sony system is, um, and it's not unique to Sony anymore, um, is the eye autofocus. Um, with a lot of the, well, with DSLRs, you would have, I think, I think the most a DSLR camera had, the focal points was about 15. With the mirrorless system, um, this is the A7R4, I think about 80% of the, of the sensor has got focal points or focus points on it. So with the DSLR at a very shallow depth of field or with a, with a wide open aperture, for example, at f1.8, you would have to focus and then recompose. And um, if you are not steady enough or if you don't know what you're doing, your focus would be out slightly. With the Sony eye autofocus, you do not have to focus and recompose anymore. You activate eye autofocus, it will lock onto your subject's eye. And even at f1.8, wherever you move the camera, as long as it's tracking the eye, you know for a fact that the eye would be in focus. So and when at it comes yeah, at, well, this is a 61 megapixel camera, so the, the detail, detail you'll get from this is amazing. Um, in terms of settings, uh, it depends on what conditions you're shooting in. So we can't give you a hard and fast um, settings rule, or setting. rule to use. Yeah. Uh, you need to decide how much of your image you want in focus. Do you want the shallow depth of field? So you would need to use um, a wide open aperture, or do you want? Uh, a bit more of your subject to be in focus. That means you would need to stop down. You'd, you'd, for example, a shallow depth of field would be uh, on the 85 mil. For me, if the lens says f1.8, I shoot at f1.8. That, that's how I shoot. Um, but you can stop it down to f5.6, f6.3, so that a bit more of your subject is in focus. So there's that's, no hard and fast Yeah, that's that. also dependent on your creative style. If you're going to be shooting for a fashion magazine, for example, sometimes they will request for you to have a lot more detail in focus. So you're going to be picking up that aperture to probably work F5, F6, depending on the whole lighting situation and stuff. But our go-to portrait lens is the 85 mm. Uh, if you're working in a uh, wedding reception uh, venue, then it's a 70 to 200 because we have to work among many other factors and also not to be um, in any way whatsoever. And then there's the 135 mil, which we still need to experiment on. Yeah, yeah. That, that has been one of my bucket lenses, so hopefully we'll be able to use that lens uh, in the near future. Uh, like I said, that 135 mil is a prime. It is, for me at least, it falls in that sweet spot um, in terms of portraiture. Any other questions coming through? We are good with this. Really and too. just remember the, the Sony voucher for the Sony gear, TTL at DT. That is the code. Um, that's a 10% cash back on Sony gear. On a few Sony gear besides yeah, the... Yeah, I think the 400 mm uh, f2.8 and the 600 mm does not, uh, it's not included in those, uh, in the 10% cashback. So just again, what, uh, how it works is you pay upfront full price and you go to www.cashbacks.za and you claim back 10%. So they'll pay you back 10% of what you paid uh, for, your, um, for your equipment. You just want to double check on the questions, are we good? Perfect. Well, that's... That went very quick. Thank you. Uh, what we're going to be doing now is, unfortunately, because we cannot tether onto the laptop, we're going to be taking images of our model exactly uh, in those lighting situations that we spoke about, and we're going to be fe featuring them on our social media platforms and explaining each shot in specific as well. So once again, guys, we'd like to thank you for joining. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Jonathan and the DT crew, uh, Sony, um, Africa, Middle East Africa, as well as 300 Squares. 300 thank you so much, Jono. Um, if you want any of the contact details of anyone involved, please contact us. We'd gladly share them with you. So until next time, guys, thanks so much for joining. Thank you so much, guys. Have a good night. Cheers. We'll see you soon. Relax. <laughs>